it's your turn. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, also it's it's weird that the fall school is now already over from my side, and that it's week 15. It seems really went by really fast. <clears throat> and um, we were also, while we planned this fall school, we were actually planning on um, building the building the API for our software to base on ourselves by ourselves. And um, but as time went by, Leon Dega joined our lab and took over the whole develop development of this API. And uh, therefore, he's now also included in this talk. And in particular, you will, we will take over the part about uh, de the developing tutorial at the end about developing APIs. <clears throat> and I will talk a bit about like the basic concept of APIs and give two examples of APIs that we have used. And um, overall, I think we won't take the whole 90 minutes. So we still have some time for questions in the end, if you join later. And um, please bear in mind that both of us are not software developers, so and only very recently got into the topic of APIs. Um, therefore, this will only be a very basic intro to the topic. Okay, let's get started. So, <clears throat> what is an API? Um, it stands for an application programming interface and um, has been around for decades, I believe, but um, at least for me, it seems that in the last few years has uh, very much increased in popularity. And um, it's basically a way for different software or different programs to interact with each other in, a, in, in an automatic way or automated way. Um, and, um, What's the what's what's um, it's therefore conceptually very different from, for example, a a user interface where a where there's an interface between a user and a program. Here, the the, the interaction between different programs or different software uh, lies in the in the um, is the focus of this this application programming interface. And um, this API involves the description of the communication and also uh, the mechanisms and the, the communication methods that are used. Um, so at the most basic level, an API is a mechanism that enables an application or service to access a real resource from another application. Okay, maybe to give an example that's not so technical or not so abstract, uh, there is a metaphor that is used uh, sometimes to describe the use of an API, and this is related to, an, to a restaurant. And in this metaphor, the um, the customer is the the one part of the software or the client, and he comes into the restaurant because he wants to consume something to eat or wants to drink something. Um, and he interacts in the restaurants in. Uh, um, if it's not a self-service restaurant, he interacts with the with the waiter and asks him for the menu. He asks him for for food, for drinks, and can interact with him to pay the check. And in this example, the waiter takes over the role of the API of the restaurant. So um, the customer interacts with the waiter and does not have to worry about what's happening in the background. So he doesn't have to prepare the food themselves. He doesn't have to um, take stock of different food or drinks. He has, doesn't have to pour drinks uh, and doesn't have to worry about all the organizational part. He just has to interact with the restaurant API and then gets uh, in exchange or gets back a response, which is then food or drink or information about the menu. And um, hopefully with this example, becomes a bit more clear what, what an API uh, or why APIs are useful. So we saw in this example, <clears throat> it can reduce the complexity or hide the complexity of, of, the, um, of the software that we are accessing. So um, 
if we use an API in real in the real world, not in this restaurant example, we don't have to know the code or even the programming language of the underlying application of the underlying um, software to use this. We just have to use the um, the communication methods that are um, uh, that are defined by the API. Uh, another example of this would, for example, be uh, an app on your mobile phone. So the app developers don't have to necessarily understand or know the underlying operating system or don't even have to understand how it works because there are APIs from that up, uh, so that are developed by people who understand the underlying operating system that provides different tasks for these for these apps developers. So for example, an API uh, where you can where you can just tell the API to create a I can or tell the API to connect your uh, connect your app to the internet, for example. Um, is it's also up um, the the so the easiest way to understand what an API does is just to access data. And um, these this is actually also what we, what we mostly use the API for. And this is very helpful when we are dealing with complex and large databases. And another usability of an API could be to extend the functionality. Um, this is because you can maybe make your software accessible to other programming languages and it's also possible to use an API to actually uh, update, for example, data on your database. And all of these use cases um, um, uh, culminated in this kind of uh, saying API first, so that if you're trying to develop a software or a, a app, you can sometimes think about implementing an API first. So first thinking about what functionalities you want to uh, provide to the user with this API in order to then uh, more intelligently and more efficiently um, design your code and building your software. Um, and just for completeness, there are many different classes of APIs um, that are diff um, suitable for different tasks. So for example, there's hardware APIs that actually interact with the hardware of a, of a system. Um, but for this talk, we will focus on the web service APIs and in particular on uh, REST APIs. And um, a REST API is, um, basically it's, well, so it stands for representational state transfer. And as it's a, a web-based API, it uh, can also be described as a network API and um, follows uh, different principles. And if an API uh, fulfills all these principles, uh, it can be called a REST API. And also if an, if an API is, is uh, it's a REST API, you can also call it RESTful API. Just was sometimes confusing for, to me what if this is actually two different things, a RESTful API or a REST API. A restful web service, and um, these these kind of rules, these kind of uh, principles, uh, involve a, a uniform interface, meaning that if one, um, in this case, in the REST API case, it's always uh, to refer to an interaction between a client and a server. If two different clients um, are requesting the diff a different thing from a server, they should get the same response, obviously. So we want a uniform interface. Um, there should also be a client-server decoupling. So there is no way for the client to actually interact directly with the software under the server, it just, just interacts by um, an URI. So, and um, some other principles. And basically it's, it works like this, that the client sends a request that is defined by the definition of the REST API to the server. The server then sends back a response, which is um, data basically, and most uh, most often JSON data, which I'll explain later on, uh, that is then referred back to the client. And the what kind of data and um, um, what kind of data and, and what the data just, um, What's the what's inside the data is also defined by the REST API, and um, 
the requests by the client um, are defined or have to be, or I don't think they have to be, but are mostly um, these four HTTP methods. And just to go back a little bit, so HTTP is, stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which means it's a so it's a it's a protocol that defines certain rules on the on the internet. Was also developed by Tim Berners-Lee. If you remember the first lecture about ontologies, he's also one of the founders of the World Wide Web and also of the Semantic Web. Uh, so it's a protocol that um, um, also involves a transfer, so a request that was trans transferred from the client to the server. And um, in case of a browser client, is, is, um, this request is then followed by a response as HTML. So HTML is uh, used as a hypertext format to, to create a browser website. And difference to the, to the browser response, a API response would then follow up with a data response. So you don't get this human readable hypertext um, as a browser response, but you get just data. And um, the HTTP protocol or the HTTP also involves a couple of um, methods or verbs, um, how to communicate. So how the client and the server should communicate in this REST API settings. And um, these are get, which basically refers to reading. So if you go back to the to the restaurant uh, metaphor, uh, the the client, the customer can ask the uh, the waiter for the menu. So nothing happens there in the background. He's just getting back. He's just reading back the order. He's just getting some uh, read information. Uh, if he uses a post method or a post verb, he's actually creating something, so he's placing an order, uh, which makes the, the waiter happy and also gets the kitchen moving. So there's actually something happening and he's getting data in response in this case, uh, this pie. And then another verb is put, which means you can update your order or update the data set on a database or delete, which would, which is basically deleting the, the order order, um, which would make the waiter a bit angry especially if they already started cooking. And um, this can be, these four main verbs can be summarized with the, with the acronym CRUD. And um, there's more possible verbs, but actually these are the four that are most commonly used. And another um, important part of the communication between the client and the, and the server, so server sending is request with an HTTP method, and the uh, the client sends a re HTTP method as a as a request, and the server then sends back a HTTP status quote, and this is kind of a feedback from the server. So uh, anything with a starting with a one of these HTTP status codes means um, it's just an informational status quote. So continue means everything is going fine so far. Uh, two is actually what you're what you're looking for. So two means uh, anything with two. Two means success. Three means that um, some further action is needed. So for example, in this case the um, the request wasn't specific enough or has led to two possible choices. And four, everything with a four starting with a four is some error on the client side. And something with a five is uh, something on the server side, some error on the server side. It's kind of like a communication. So if you if you ask someone for the time and it just takes too long to answer, you're probably going to end that conversation because it's getting weird. Okay, one, one um, very important format for the response of the server to the client is the JSON format or JavaScript object notation. And, um, this is actually what's commonly used for by REST APIs and is generally, I would say, a very commendable, forber, commendable uh, format. And it's very lightweight and uh, easy to read and use, uh, read, read and write even by humans. So this is this would be a JSON format. You can see if it's easy to express, so you can just interpret it like, like normal text, first name John, last name Doe. 
Uh, it's kind of similar and in some parts different from XML. Um, but I would say I would prefer JSON always about uh, over XML because just because it's uh, XML is much more difficult to pass, and um, JSON can basically be read by any computer by any programming language. And um, um, just to describe what JSON can do, so there are different JSON types. And this just means so it's always in this key value pair format, and these values can can have various types. So, for example, here a, a uh, just numbers. They can have a string. They can have um, another object. So you can also have a hierarchical data structure that goes can go um, all the way down to a limitless nesting hierarchical um, structures. And uh, you can also have um, arrays, lists as as values, and can also um, have booleans as a value. So you can describe very complex data with this JSON format. For example, here this is actually taken from this uh, knowledge graph, from this subgraph from NeuroMMSIC that we showed in one of the lectures. So uh, pathways that are that are related to Alzheimer's disease. Um, yeah, and just to mention this, there's also JSON LV, which is um, uh, JSON linked data, and this is actually uh, one of the concepts I talked about in the ontology um, lecture. And what this also com incorporates is uh, more more information about the data, so it helps to disambiguate the data because. Uh, by by adding this context, which means it it adds a description file, so a file or document that defines all the namespaces that are inside this document. For example, if you look here at the at the key pair or the key first, it's not clear what this first should mean. In this case, it's uh, it refers to to first name, but it could also first could also refer to the first place in some kind of competition, right? So with JSON-LD, this ambiguity would be defined in the context or by these um, uh, ID parts, which refers to global identifiers if this uh, refers to the already, already defined namespace. OK, so much for the general introduction. And now for the first uh, API, I think the software should be familiar to you already because we showed this in uh, the neural anatomy talk and it, the software is skyview which is a um, large literature database which uh, has more than 35 million um, highly structured publications that have been annotated by means of literature mining with the promani software that's this means that you can look for specific terms from specific ontologies or terminologies um next to normal freeze text searches for example in this example we searched for um, alzheimer's disease and amyloid beta in the mesh terminology and moreover lets you analyze this quantitatively uh, or lets you analyze quantitatively which annotations um, are contained in the articles of your search query and of course this skyview gui has also a skyview api and um, Another thing I want to mention here is uh, the Swagger, which is a open source API documentation framework um, that helps um, developers and users to, in, to um, kind of design and document um, and users then uh, to consume these RESTful, REST, uh, REST APIs. And um, um, it's I think the most popular tool for generating interactive documentation for APIs and um, also uh, just provides this very neat uh, user interface for checking out APIs. And um, because the, the, the so, so to say, the back end of the Swagger documentation, documentation page is the open API specification document. And um, 
this open API specification from version 3.0 uh, 3.0 is called open API specification before that it was called uh, the swagger specification that's why it's this is still called swagger 2.0 and this is used to document the ACP APIs using standardized formats, especially JSON, and um, is language agnostic, so it's a programming language agnostic specification. And um, in order to be an open ACP API specification, you can check this out on this GitHub, GitHub page, uh, it needs to have all root objects of an OP, an open API, API specification. So uh, um, has to have these main parts. So the open API specification, the info tags, which are kind of the overarching categories, has to define the paths with the underlying uh, URL requests that your API can get from the client to then get uh, sent back a response uh, from the server. Yeah, and so on. So, and um, this is the open API specification, and this is then this then translates into this uh, very neat Swagger uh, user interface. And as you can see here, these these URL correspond to these Swagger URLs as well. Yeah. All right. So, and this is now the um, documentation of the Skyview API and yeah, you have different tags here which are the overarching categories and you have the um, these um, URLs so or also called the the endpoints with the corresponding HTTP verb and um, uh, other points are these um, path parameters and these curly brackets that you have to specify in order to to get a correct response so and this this Swagger documentation then also tells you exactly what it expects from a from a from a request. So the request body in this case should be a query, and these the query definition how to form it. So just how to how to form the syntax is um, defined further down. In this it's not on this not on this slide, but it's just further further down in this Swagger documentation. And um, if you then correctly use, uh, correctly define the the uh, the request body and all the other um, path parameters, you get a um, a correct status code and also the response body, which in this case uh, returns documents for search query, returns the and I looked for just a free text example, so it returns all documents that have some text. That refers to example, so quite a lot. And the same thing, obviously. So this is this is a nice feature that you can that you can use the Swagger UI to check out these these API um, um, your um, endpoints, the, these API functions. But basically, what you want to use the API for is to find a program program to program interface, right? And this is the nice thing with these uh, with the Swagger documentation. It's really easy to then define, for example, in Python your uh, API requests. And for Python, you just have to import this uh, JSON package and the requests package, and then just use the URL that was defined by the Swagger page, um, send a request with the correct HTTP verb. And then get back. So it takes a takes a bit of time, and then get back the same response as we saw on the Swagger UI. Yeah. So this, as an example, maybe is a, a simpler API. And then the the last thing I want to talk about is another uh, example of an API that is a bit more complex, and is. Um, Used for the eBrains knowledge graph, and the eBrains knowledge graph is a uh, framework that um, um, tries to bring together very, very different fields and different species. So data from different fields, different data from different species, um, 
tries to integrate that in, uh, integrates this uh, this data and from a kind of these different species, but also models from uh, and other software um, data into a graph database this, uh, that then looks like this um, and outlines their relation to each other. Um, so for example, um, connecting a data set to software tools that could be used to look into this data set um, or that could be used to visualize a certain data. And this connected, so this, this graph that is um, comprised of connected data then also enables users to use more um, complex search queries and more so to say, intelligent search queries. And um, yeah, let's just uh, zoom in into the to the knowledge graph. And for these shared resources to be found and understood, um, they must be tagged by elements describing uh, attributes and, and um, about that resource. And we have a lot of different metadata schemas that give them structure and. Um, uh, outlet these descriptions of the different data sets. And Ibrahim's, this, this Ibrahim's knowledge graph also has adopted the open mind schema that you heard about in previous lectures. Okay, and this is then the architecture. Um, well, as you can see, there's also a lot of APIs involved in this architecture. And um, so the, the, um, the knowledge, knowledge graph tries to, or provides many tools and APIs that try to hide then the complexity of this uh, semantic multi-data source metadata management. Um, and for this work, you have to have this kind of uh, more complex um, involvement of many different components. And the main components are the blue brain nexus, which are these, these blue parts, and then uh, extensions that were built or integrated by the by eBrains. And for example, this uh blaze graph is um a triplet store so triplet as you remember maybe from the ontology lecture also um, linked data so always with a subject a relation to an object and uh, elastic search uh, has is used for for storing the full text queries of that knowledge graph um the knowledge graph also has a normal user interface where you can query different data sets and then explore them just by clicking on them, but has also an API access where you can programmatically query something. But as you saw, the, the complexity of this knowledge graph is so high that even querying it is also some somewhat of a of known undertaking. So you first have to define a query with many different path parameters, then upload this query and to actually get to the data. And that is why um, there are then again abstracted from this um, new API approaches like this Zebra multi-level Atlas interface that then uh, tries to um, hide much of this complexity of the of the of querying this um, metadata monster that it's the the eBrains knowledge graph and um, so this and the Zebra has been has been um, developed and designed to allow um, access or interaction with brain regions on the one hand, so with the human, uh, your brain's human brain atlas, and also um, access to the concepts, uh, concepts and data sets from the e-brain's knowledge graph. Also supports open, open minds and um, structured data queries. Sorry. <laughs> And as I said, Zebra hides much of the complexity that would be required to interact with these, uh, with the human brain atlas and also with the knowledge graph. And um, it's composed of different concepts and different ideas. And um, so the first are the semantic concepts where they have defined um, atlases as the most high level concepts. Uh, that then provide a common context for a collection of parcellations and reference spaces um, of the same species, which are integrated with each other through semantic and spatial links. Um, 
and similar to atlases brain um, parcellations are also semantic objects in this in this um, conceptual overview of zebra and define a hierarchy of brain regions so an, an information about available parcellation maps in different reference spaces and additional metadata about the parcellation that's all in this one brain parcellation semantic concept um, and another um, pillar of these zebra concepts is are the spatial concepts and um, here these uh, the reference spaces uh, have spatial representa representation in different or have spatial representations in specific coordinate, coordinate systems. Um, and for example, a space provides a, a reference template and a parcellation provides parcellation maps of possibly different types uh, in different reference spaces. And spatial objects are obtained from semantic objects by specifying a space. So it combines all these semantic and spatial representations uh, to then um, get to actual concrete data. And this is obviously data that's related to these spatial concepts, but it's also um, multimodal data features that Zero then extracts from the eBrain's knowledge graph. And um, in order to do this, you, if you want to use Zero, you first have to, to access the eBrain's knowledge graph. And that you can do um, by just um, uh, providing eBrain's, so well, setting up an eBrain's account and then providing an, an authentic, 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 authentication token, that's it, yeah. uh, for using all features provided by, by Zebra. And if you do this, you can then access different data modalities, for example, uh, receptor density data, that is, so region-specific receptor density data for 17 different data ligands, um, or you can extract gene expression data from the that extracted from the from the uh, element human brain at least class for over um, 160,000 genes, and uh, so also as a regional data data feature. But you can also extract uh, something like, like global data features from. Um, so, for example, with the question, um, which bundles connect this um, uh, V four visual cortex area and the entorhinal cortex using probabilistic um, um, uh, probabilistic maps. No. Okay, so this is an example of a more complex API that's still using a uh, still using a database on its back end. So. Oftentimes, so from these REST APIs, the underlying application is a database that can be uh, very complex, like the knowledge graph, or can be a bit less complex, like the sky view. Okay, so you know, the references and some tools that I will post in the, the chat also when, when Leon now takes over. And that's it from my part. And Leon will now show you a bit of an API tutorial and some best practices. Exactly. Thanks for the talk, Konstantin. Um, just... Yes. So I should now be able to, to share my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, you should now see the beautiful Californian uh, sunset. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, thanks again, Konstantin, for the introduction. And um, yeah, as we now are semi-experts into the in the theoretics of APIs, um, let's get into like how to actually create uh, the first steps maybe um, of an API. Um, with Python or uh, with Python code. Um, and uh, as we are somehow limited in time, and this is also not a computer science class, uh, I will really like burn it down to the very basics and concentrate on like just a few um, aspects of uh, API development. 
Um, I will, for example, not uh, go into how to set up a database. Um, I will mainly uh, concentrate on three things, uh, which is like how to set up an API in the first place. Uh, secondly, like how to implement existing software through an API. Um, because I can imagine this is maybe a, a use case that is uh, accessible to most people. Like, let's say you kind of implemented or wrote an, or, or you have an, uh, a, a complex uh, algorithm, let's say, and you want to make it accessible through um, through an API. Um, so we will see how how that works. And finally, how uh, I will show you how to get information from the user. Uh, to through the API to like the uh, if we want to um, take this analogy um, of the restaurant um, to the kitchen and um, and then get the food back to the to the, to the customer. Okay, um, obviously there's uh, way more to API development uh, than we can kind of cover now. Um, so if you want any further information um, or like in-depth tutorials, check out the links that uh, I think Konstantin already posted uh, to the chat. Um, they're really great tutorials on YouTube and um, and also the software uh, that I will present and use. Uh, they also have great uh, web pages with um, really in-depth documentation. So um, this should uh, have you covered if you if you want any any uh, more information. But also, of course, you can uh, you can ask questions anytime. All right. Um, I will just kind of create the code and and tell you what I'm doing uh, along the way. So I will enter now my um, my text editor, and as you can see, uh, there's already something there. Um, I wrote like for functions to kind of uh, act as a substitute for a very complex algorithm. This one uh, performs, uh, <laughs> or these these functions uh, perform different mathematical operations um, on an input that will be just a number. And um, just imagine it's more complex, but I guess for uh, demonstration purposes, this should do. Um, and I also already set up my virtual environment. Um, I'm gonna skip that also for time purposes. Um, let me know if I'm uh, if I'm like proceeding too fast. I can always uh, explain the sub steps. All right. Um, so uh, in order to create our API or develop our API, um, we will use a Python package called uh, Fast API. And as the name suggests, uh, it kind of allows you to get your API up and running uh, rather quickly, and it's also quite intuitive to learn. And it's also like it comes with uh, some advantages. For example, um, as a lot of people are using it, uh, there's a good pr uh, it presence online. So the chances are that uh, if you run into a problem, people before you did it um, and hopefully already solved it. So that's always a good feature <laughs> of a software package. Um, it also comes with automatic documentation. So uh, Constantine told you earlier about um, the the swagger style documentation that is kind of necessary to understand an API, right? Because you don't have access to to the code, so you won't understand what the API does if there is no uh, understandable documentation. And as you could also see, the JSON format uh, of document of documenting an API is quite tedious or quite uh, long and complex. So it's really cool that uh, that Fast API kind of just creates the swagger style documentation page. Um, in parallel um, as we develop our API, um, but I will show you that later. Um, it also comes with uh, automatic data validation. Uh, what that means is uh, we can kind of define what we want to accept uh, at a certain endpoint, at a certain, um, let's say, address of the API. And if this is not met, if the information is not met or the uh, HTTP method is not right, uh, Fast API will automatically um, create a, an error message that will uh, inform the user exactly what went wrong. And uh, finally, it also uh, kind of automatically transforms um, data into the JSON format. 
um, so we also don't have to care about that. So uh, all in all, it's uh, it's a pretty handy tool. So uh, let's get started. Um, first thing I will do is uh, I will open up a terminal. I'm uh, in Visual Studio Code, so um, it has kind of this integrated terminal, but if you're in a different text editor, uh, yeah, feel uh, now you should just open a terminal and uh, type it in there. Um, so first things first, we will just install um, Fast API like this. As you can see, I already installed it. Um, but for you, if you are coding along or maybe watching the video uh, on YouTube, um, it should now install uh, install everything you need, and um, you should be good to go. So now I will just uh, close this terminal again. Um, the next thing is I will uh, create a new file and I will just call it api.py and this will be the script um, that in, in which we will uh, create our, uh, our API. Um, the first thing we will do is just uh, import from fast API that we just installed um, fast API. And yeah, mind the mind the, the spelling. It's case sensitive, so uh, yeah, it has to be like this. And the next thing is we will create a variable and um, assign to this variable an instance of Fast API, like this. And uh, now now within this variable, uh, we will kind of. Uh, we will always address this variable when we want to, for example, yeah, change something, add something to the API, to the functionality, to the documentation. Uh, if we want to start it up and host it on a server, for example, it's always going to be the app variable. Um, okay, and I mean, that's basically already uh, the, the first step in setting up an API. And now we could technically just uh, go ahead and create our first endpoints. And um, I would suggest we just do that. Um, maybe just for starters, we will just we, we will not uh, get too fancy. We will just uh, maybe display uh, or return a, a greeting message um, to to test if if everything works fine. So um, to to define or build uh, an endpoint, uh, uh, the first step is to just uh, use this add uh, decorator then reference the, the variable that we assigned our fast API instance to dot. And now we have to define um, the HTTP method that uh, Constantine explained earlier. And um, as we just want to get information, um, in this case, a greeting, um, I will say get. And then in uh, these brackets, uh, I will define where this endpoint will be available. And I don't have to uh, write the whole URL, the whole uh, um, HTTP uh, address, but I just need to add um, what comes after the base uh, URL, basically. So if we were to host this API at uh, like www.api.com, we wouldn't need to write this. We just need to write what comes after the .com. Um, I will just put a slash. And what this means is uh, it's kind of synonymous to just there's nothing else. All right. Um, okay, so now we have an endpoint. And uh, the next step is to kind of define what the API should do at that endpoint. And we can do this by just defining a function right underneath this, um, this route uh, decorator. Uh, I will just call this function say hello, because this is what it will do. It won't take any input. And it will return uh, a Python dictionary um, that uh, kind of resembles a JSON, and uh, that uh, yeah, that's the, uh, as we know, this is kind of the way uh, we communicate uh, within the HTTP um, realm. So we will stick to that. So I will just say message colon hello maybe a smiley okay so um let's save that and now we 
are actually good to go and we could uh, we could test if this uh, if our api works and um the way we will test it is we will open up a terminal and um uh, we want obviously it's not ready to to be published and made available to the public um uh, so we will host it kind of on a local server. Uh, we will kind of simulate a server on our uh, local machine, so uh, the the API is available or accessible only within our uh, local machine. And we can do this by using UVCorn. It should be installed uh, already on your on your PC or Mac, but uh, if it isn't, just type in pip install UVCorn, and you should be good to go. And then um, with UVCorn, we will access the, um, the the Python script that we are developing our API in. I called it API fitting uh, name. And then we will use a colon and uh, we will access the, the app variable um, where we assigned our fast API instance to. And finally, I will add this uh, it's uh, like two dashes and reload and what this will do is it will make the api kind of listen to code changes um and automatically reload and um, this comes in handy because otherwise with every code change the api would crash and um as we are developing one we will there will be a lot of code changes so um let's hit enter okay great so uh, the terminal tells us the application startup is complete. That's what we want. And it also gives us the base URL where um, where our API is um, where our API is hosted. So let's follow the link. And I will go back to the desktop and show you what happened. Um, my web browser opened up and it displays at the URL that we uh, yeah, that our API is hosted at, um, it displays us the our nice welcome message. Um, so it seems to work, that's great. Um, and as we are in the browser already, let's access the, um, the documentation page. It's just at the base URL slash docs. And as we can see, uh, we see a very, um, yeah, uh, limit or <laughs> yeah, very, uh, um, basic uh, documentation page in, in the swagger style um obviously it's not as complex as what what uh constantine showed us earlier but um yeah it we, we will not get there uh in this in this um presentation but it will look a little nicer once we are finished i hope um anyway what you can see is uh there's a get meth method that's what we defined right um this is the name of the function um, it doesn't take any parameters and we can try it out. And if, because it doesn't take any parameters, we can just execute and we will see what we get back also with the status code 200. So everything is uh, perfectly fine. Um, so this is great for the user, uh, as we already stated, like um, this is perfect to kind of figure out what an API does. But during development, I would now uh, like switch to a different um, software that helps you kind of manage your requests and um, manip manipulate them a little easier and gives you just overall more functionality. Uh, it's called Postman, which should be visible now. Um, and what like, yeah, it, it has vast functionality and I'm only gonna scratch the first surface now, but basically what it allows you to do um, is kind of create requests and define uh, parameters, uh, define the change the the request body, and um, and save all of them. So, for if you if you're only if you, like during development, um, you will have to reload inst like all the time uh, your documentation if you would uh, test it through the documentation page. And this kind of uh, allows you uh, to to keep everything together. And also um, it displays the, the response from the API in a nicer way and it's, it's more capable in dealing with non-JSON format. Um, okay, so uh, let's, let's give it a try uh, with, with Postman. I will just copy the, the URL.
and send it here. Here we can define the, the HTTP method. This is the URL window and now I'm sending it and we should get back the, um, the, the JSON that we defined earlier as well like with, with some more information, like for example, how long it took, how big the data size was and the status code obviously. Okay, so now we know like the principle of uh, building a an endpoint, um, but to be honest, uh, this is not very interesting yet because uh, like it doesn't take any input and it doesn't perform any um, any effort or any computational operation. Um, so let's now get into how to send information or let, how to receive information from the user. Take this information as an input to your underlying um, software and then how to return it. So first thing we want to do is uh, importing the complex uh, software that I wrote. Um, I will for starters I think only add uh, import like one of the functions. And um, I will also, oops, I will also define a new endpoint again with the at app dot get slash um, let's say do math and then I will define um, a function that does math and this function will take uh, an, as an input the number that we need um, as an input to our software. And um, within this function now, we can uh, store the results of the software that we want. We can just call the software in here, take a number as an input, and then we will return a JSON um, style dictionary, uh, which says the result is whatever is the result of the software. Okay, so now there are several ways, as Konstantin already said, um, uh, into how to, how, how to kind of send uh, send information to a to an API. One of them, and I guess the most intuitive one, would be um, through path parameters. And um, you already got a hint um, in the presentation. Um, it's by using basically you define at the beginning of the endpoint. Uh, at the root um, where this endpoint should be addressable. And then after like the URL, uh, you just add curly brackets and uh, a variable. And this variable has to be entered to reach this endpoint. And, um, but it, the user can kind of choose what it should be. And for, uh, for in order to have the automatic validation, we can within this function that defines what we want to do at that endpoint, um, you can define like this with a colon and an int that it should be an integer. And now this should work as follows. Um, the user can send a, a get request to this URL, exchange this with a number. This number goes into the function or the API will take this uh, this parameter, this path parameter, and put it into the software. Um, and then it will return whatever the software uh, software returns. So um, now we save it and we will go back to Postman and create a new request with the base URL. and do math i think i called the endpoint and now ah, i already tested it so um i will just say four right and what should happen now behind the scenes is the four uh like at do math the four will be sent into the function uh, the the um, function will add two to four and then we should get back six as a result and uh, this is exactly what happens 
So that's great. Um, I can now show you also how the validation works. Um, if I, for example, don't type in an integer, but a string, uh, let's say five, if I send this, we should get a, a kind of a detailed validation report. Like um, it says at the number uh, variable, um, we would have expected an integer. And um, so now we know what's wrong. And also we get the status uh, code that the entity that was sent to the API is not processable. And it's the four, uh, starting with the four, so it says it's on the user side, the problem. So let's change that back. Okay. Um, we also previously, uh, previously saw in Constantine's uh, presentation that uh, you can basically add as many uh, path parameters as you want. Um, so I would take this chance to um, kind of give maybe the user the option to uh, choose which type of oper mathematical operation it uh, it he or she uh, would like to perform on the on the number um, that was sent or that is input uh, to to this endpoint. And for this, I will just uh, define another path parameter. It's called operation. And then I will um, add it to this uh, to to the input of this function. I will just write operation string because it should be a string. And then, uh, yeah, to make it maybe a little more complex, uh, I will write a conditional um, that does addition if the operation um, is addition. And let's say if the operation is uh, multiplication, um, it should not do addition or it should not call the add to um, function, but I think I called it multiply by two, yeah. And it, yeah, perfect. Okay, so now we kind of have the choice uh, between uh, using multiplication or addition. If we, um, if we uh, go back to the to Postman, now it would need another uh, four. And as you can see, I was already tried it, so it should still work. Um, now it says, uh, now it does addition. If we exchange this with multiplication, uh, oh, what happened? Probably I just typed in something. Ah, oh, I didn't give it an input. Here we go. Yeah, okay. So this also works now. Um, the Probably the, the big uh, limitation um, of this way of getting information to, uh, through the API to the software is that it is always mandatory, right? Because if you if now the user wouldn't type in operation, um, we would arrive at a different URL. So um, there's no way of making um, input to this endpoint uh, optional. And uh, this is probably um, what if if this was the case, and if you wanted to implement such uh, functionality, uh, you would need to. Um, you would need to uh, refer to query parameters. And um, I will just very quickly show you how that's done. Um, yeah, I guess in a, in, a new, uh, in a new endpoint, let me just do this quickly. Um, I will call this one do math query. And um, Again, a function that does math with a query. And then it's basically the same as up here. So I will just copy and paste. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this technically does exactly the same. It just works a little differently. Um, 
this is now not addressed by just uh, appending uh, to the URL, but um, if you wanted to access it through code, it would be um, something like this, like www.api.com and then slash, uh, no, um, a question mark, and this would kind of start the query that you sent to the API. So um, in this case, you would say number is three, and with this sign, I think in English you say end percent or something like this, um, and then you would define the operation or whatever uh, query parameter you would uh, like to add. Um, I would just quickly save this and show you within Postman because this, there's a cool feature um, that lets you define those query parameters um, a little more, like um, a little easier and uh, a little more organized. So um, I will copy this URL. And I think I called it query. And um, now we can just add the query parameters that we want to send to this um, to to this endpoint. So it would be a number, and as you can see, it kind of uh, fills it in automatically. Uh, and we say it's six, and then we would define the operation. And I think well, I guess we will do addition. And if we send it, uh huh, what's the problem? Maybe. I think you called it math minus query, maybe? I don't know. Ah, yes, I did. Thank you. <laughs> Very attentive. Okay, great. So now it should work hopefully. No, like this. Now uh, the function is is underscore query. Yeah, but that's fine. That doesn't really matter. Like that's you fine. can call it whatever. Okay. Um, it just uh, what like the only difference it makes is that it's visible within the documentation. So if we if we um, it's actually not even visible. So um, because uh, Path API within the doc uh, Fast API within the documentation. Um, takes kind of the scores out. Um, so yeah, it doesn't really matter. I guess for uniformity and aesthetics, you, we should later uh, change those uh, and unify them. But okay, so anyway, it uh, works like this, but um, still they are, uh, they are uh, mandatory. So if you would, for example, um, like the uh, the software to default to something. Uh, in our case, maybe let's say that addition should be the default uh, operation. Um, we can do this by importing um, from typing uh, optional. And uh, then we can just define here that um, that this uh, input, this particular input to the function should be optional. And uh, afterwards, we can assign it to the default value. So in our case, we will say addition. And now if we go back to, uh, to the postman and we just uh, keep this out, it should still do addition. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, okay, so these would be, I guess, the most, uh, the, the two basic uh, ways of interacting with or uh, uh, implementing the ability to interact with an API. Um, I'm not sure if I should go further and show how to, um, how to send uh, requests or re like how to make the API uh, be sensitive to request bodies, um, or if we should stop it here and uh, and uh, give some time to to possible questions about maybe also the exam. Um, what do you guys think? Normally the lecture goes until uh, half past seven, and afterwards it's time for questions. 
Okay, great. Then I will just continue. Um, so as uh, Konstantin um, also uh, already said, um, these are like kind of the basic, uh, the, my, like in the in the restaurant um, uh, analogy, this would probably um, be the uh, the pendant to ordering the menu, to asking for the menu. Like there is not no uh, no change basically um, on the server side. Um, and usually, when you want uh, to kind of um, to either send uh, more complex data um, or uh, create, a, a, for example, an entry in the database or things like that, um, you would first uh, send, uh, use a different HTTP method, uh, which would be a post. But also more importantly, you would send, um, you would send the information not through, like the, the information you would need to send would be way bigger as, uh, as we could see earlier. And um, if we did this through pass, uh, path qu or query parameters, it would be a nice long um, uh, URL. And um, therefore, we have JSON, and we can send JSON files within requests to the API. Um, so let's figure out how to how to um, how to implement that the API takes this request and uh, that the API kind of validates the um, content of those uh, JSON files. So, as I already said, we will um, create a, a endpoint that allows the HTTP POST, uh, yeah, HTTP POST uh, method. Um, again, an arbitrary name for the address, let's say, uh, complex math <laughs> and um, he, now we will define a, a function that will be complex math again and uh, here now we would like to get the JSON and um, uh, now like the, the, the those automatic validation functions uh, of um, Fast API are not applying anymore, so we need to kind of uh, we need to uh, define that ourselves, and we can do that by defining a, a schema, a validation schema that um, uh, that kind of defines the shape uh, of the information that we would like to get into um, that we would like to receive, that we would like to work with, and we can uh, do this by uh, using base model. Um, I will just uh, from Pydantic, I imported base model and um, defining an, uh, uh, an input schema uh, is much like defining a class or uh, in, yeah, in, in Python. So I will do that. I will just call it schema. I will make this. And this will inherit from base model. And what we can do now within this uh, class is defining all the entities that we would like to receive through a JSON uh, uh, file. So uh, as we uh, just, as our uh, underlying software is not complex and it won't get any more complex, I will just stick with the functionality that we already implemented. Um, and that is, we will have a number and it says, uh, it, it will be an integer and uh, we will have uh, the operation and that will be a string. And uh, here we could also say uh, optional if we wanna, wanted to do this and uh, make it default to something. So let's again say addition. Okay, so now uh, we can um, refer to this object that we, or to the schema um, within the uh, function that defines what the API does at this particular 
um, endpoint. So uh, I will just call, um, how do I call it? Uh, request. And um, this request uh, will not now, like we will not define it as an integer or a string, but it will um, be validated according to this schema. So uh, I will put schema here. And now we can basically, uh, again, if we wanted to implement the same thing, um, uh, just copy the code, except for that operation is now within the schema. So we can now access uh, access like the contents of the message that we get or the request that we get, the request body, by uh, referring to the request dot and whatever we, de we defined in schema. So uh, if request dot operation is addition and so on and so forth. Um, I think I will still copy it. Uh, I don't know. No, I will, I will write it out. Okay, then uh, result will be um, at two and then we put request dot um, number. Okay, and then we can return it again. Okay, so now basically we have like um, three different ways of uh, sending information to an API and um, yeah, kind of uh, rising with functionality. So uh, for simple uh, operations, for example, menu, you would probably use uh, the path parameters. Then for a little more complex uh, queries um, and for the functionality of implementing a, um, the, the, the functionality uh, that a query can be optional um, or, or default to something, you would use uh, the, the query parameters and um, for uh, post, the, the post or like the create um, functionality of the, the CRUD uh, framework, um, you would use um, request bodies. Uh, within, within Postman, let's create another uh, request. This time it will not be get, but post. And it will again at this base URL. Uh, what did I call it? Complex math. And now um, with Postman, it would work like this. Um, you would go to body um, and kind of define a JSON and you can find it at raw text and then JSON format. And within this field, you can now uh, define the body that uh, that the request should have and uh, as and as we uh, defined it in our input schema um, earlier so there should be a number and we will say it's three and then a comma and um, an operation and we will say it's uh, multiplication. I think we have implemented that. Okay, so if we send it now, we will get back six. So uh, it's it works. And maybe uh, to close this uh, talk, I will just uh, go back to the documentation page and see what happened. 
so now um, we can also see the the post uh, the post endpoint, and if we extend that, we can see um, there are no parameters, but there is a required requ request body um, where the addition uh, defaults to uh, where the operation um, parameter defaults to addition. And if we try it out and uh, and send it, we should get back two. Okay. And maybe uh, as a nice aesthetic uh, ending, uh, let's just uh, quickly uh, um, cut into how, how you can change the documentation. Um, it defaults, the title defaults to fast API. So if we go back to our code, uh, we can access the fast API instance that we are working on. And we can define a title, and we can say, I don't know, uh, cool API. And if we save it um, and go back to the documentation, it should now have changed. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, regarding the documentation, I am still uh, kind of um, exploring uh, all the options because there are a lot. Um, so uh yeah for this for more detailed documentation i would refer to um to the the fast api web page um that that constantine um posted to the chat okay i think uh, with this i would close uh, my my tutorial um thanks for your attention and uh and i mean i'm open for any questions and good luck for for the exam <laughs>